Greetings. And welcome to the How to Build a People's Movement workshop, sponsored by Harvard Divinity School's Racial Justice and Healing Initiative and Harambe. My name is David Price, and I am a first year Masters of Divinity candidate here at Harvard Divinity School. And it is my honor to welcome you into this space, and I thank you for your presence today. Friends, we have gathered here in the Braun Room to converse, contemplate, and collaborate one with another on how we can most effectively build populist, transformative movements that utilize imagination and creativity. To lead this conversation, we have a distinguished man, none other than the Reverend William Barber. But before I move forward, I must note that this event is being recorded, and later in, um, in, in the event, there will be a question and answering period, so I would like for you to, rem to remain mindful that all of our questions and answers will be on the record. Secondly, this event was coordinated with the Black Policy Conference happening at Harvard Kennedy School. And after this session, we invite you to the Black Policy Conference's opening reception that will begin at 5.30 over at the Kennedy School. Lastly, I recognize that the design of this particular space is staged for a lecture. This is no lecture. This event is designed for interactive learning and engagement. So I encourage you to be as participative as you'd like so that together we can engage in an active learning space. At this time, we'll, can we all please stand for one moment and join hands with our neighbors? I would like to pause for a moment of silence as we touch and agree one with another, recognizing that we are all in this struggle for freedom and justice together. Let us usher in a spirit of togetherness with our silence. Thank you. At this time, it is my honor to welcome Duran DuBose from Harvard Kennedy School. Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Derwin DeBose. I'm a Sheila C. Johnson Fellow at the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, a mouthful. Um, but wanted to um, just tell you about the Sheila C. Johnson Fellowship, which has funded Dr. Barber's visit to Harvard for these two days with this event, one at the Center for Public Leadership and the Black Policy Conference. The Sheila C. Johnson Fellowship uh, was launched at the Center for Public Leadership to study disparities in underserved communities. Um, Sheila C. Johnson, the benefactor, was the co-founder of Black Entertainment Television and was also the first black female billionaire. She's decided to invest in the future of uh, underserved communities by sending scholars to spend time at the Kennedy School. Uh, we just uh, completed the rounds. Uh, I'm an, uh, an inaugural fellow of the Sheila C. Johnson Fellowship. We just accepted our second class. So if you know people who are interested in uh, underserved communities from a public policy perspective, please encourage them to apply for the third cohort that will be coming along. Um, the fellowship offers a generous package to allow people to be here. And again, the focus is on underserved communities in the United States. So we thank you for this opportunity to be with you and just wanted to, uh, again, uh, welcome Dr. Barber, Ms. Allen, and welcome a discussion about healing and reconciliation in our country that is so fractured. Thank you. Is he wearing a jacket? Just put it right about there. Today we're truly it's honored on, and blessed right to have the Reverend William Barber with us. Dr. Re Dr. Reverend William Barber is president of the North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. Dr. Barber assembled and now leads a coalition of over 104 progressive organizations, representing over 2 million members, to champion a 14-point anti-racism, anti-poverty, anti-war agenda. As part of the coalition's Moral Monday movement, tens of thousands of demonstrators have peacefully protested the North Carolina General Assembly's actions against Medicaid, voter rights, public education, and health. More than 900 people were arrested in North Carolina, and the protest movement spread to Georgia and South Carolina. Dr. Barber is also pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, 
which is a Disciples of Church, a Disciples of Christ in, um, community in Goldsboro, a 120-year-old congregation with over 400 members and 30 active ministries. He's also chairperson of the Rebuilding Broken Places Community Development Corporation, a nonprofit organization involved with building affordable single-family homes and senior citizen housing and providing job training, affordable childcare, and inner-city revitalization in Goldsboro. Dr. Barber has held adjunct faculty positions at both Duke University and North Carolina Central University and is the author of two books, Preaching Through Unexpected Pain and Forward Together, A Moral Message for the Nation. He graduated with honors from a B with a BA in public administration from North, North Carolina Central University, earned his Master of Divinity from the Duke Divinity School and his doctoral degree from Drew University. Today, we're also pleased to have Yara Allen with us. Yara Allen is the cultural and artistic voice of the Moral Mondays movement. She was the first to speak from the Forward Together Moral Mondays movement and stressed the need for a collective effervescence. She's passionate about creating prophetic spaces where the collective voice of the disenfranchised can be expressed. Every successful human rights movement must have a rhythm and music interpretation that provides strength, stamina, and joy. So today, Ms. Allen will offer us a demonstration of how to engage sound and rhythm in building and transforming populist movements. First, Yara will offer us a song, and then Reverend Barber will share his reflections. Good evening, everybody. Is it okay if I move this, if I take this down? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I am very happy, first of all, to be here. This is my first time in your state. And what a day to come, right? <laughs> I, I came in flip-flops and I'm in boots now. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. Whoever is holding spring hostage, y'all just pay the money so we can get on with this right here. So in the movement, um, one of the important features of the movement is the song. And the Forward Together Moral Movement has taken the liberty to borrow from the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s spirituals that appeared through that movement. And they appeared because the church was so interwoven with the movement. Oftentimes, uh, there would be meetings in a church building before a protest. Um, Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama is one example where they would meet and pray and strategize and build each other up and then go out to fight. And so through the years, we've borrowed, we've kind of reached back and borrowed some of those songs from the church, and we've tweaked them just a little bit to fit the movement. And so you'll hear songs in the movement, songs like, Keep, keep praying till it comes. Keep praying. Till it comes, keep praying till it comes. I know justice is coming soon. And with a little rhythm, it goes keep praying till it comes, keep praying till it comes. Keep praying till it comes. I know justice is coming soon. Keep marching till it comes. Keep marching till it comes. Keep marching till it comes, I know justice is coming soon. Keep fighting, let me hear you. Keep fighting. That's it, that's it. 
Keep fighting till it comes. Keep fighting till it comes. I know justice is coming soon. Let me hear you say that justice is coming soon. Come on and say it, y'all. Keep right on praying, justice is coming soon. Don't stop fighting, cause justice, justice is coming soon. You keep on loving, cause justice, justice is coming soon. Keep on praying, cause justice, justice is coming soon. I know it's coming. Justice is coming soon. And that would just be maybe one of the songs that you would hear in the movement that was borrowed from the civil rights movement. And then there's another one in the tradition of call and response, where you call out to the audience and the audience answers you back. And that's pretty much like preaching, y'all. That's, that's, don't you want somebody to answer you back? When, when the preacher says, can I get an amen? Yeah. So that's what call and response pretty much is. So when I say, hold on, you say, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on, on the, the prize. prize, hold on. on. Can we try to get a good rhythm going? Mm -hmm. Can you stand? Oh. Get some blood going through. You can sound better when you got your blood going. Mm -hmm. Ready? Hold on. Miss Yara Allen. She guides the liturgy in our movement as uh, what we call a, a friend of mine, John, it's called Theomusicology. Uh, and we probably call it Theo Movement Musicology. It is good to be here to join with you at, here at Harvard and Divinity School. Um, one of my good friends and uh, is, is, is Dr. Um, Gil Grillchris, uh, who graduated, who pastored the church in Detroit, I believe. He used to call him the Harvard Hooper, is that right? Uh, so it's good to be here with you. My daughter graduated from here. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Forward Together Moral Monday movement uh, in North Carolina and other parts of the country. I also want to give you two dates. Write this down, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, May 19th. May 19th, and I'll come back to this. If I forget it, you remind May 19th 
and July the 6th because whenever I talk to people, I always have an ask. Uh, ask and you shall be given. Um, th Darren, thank you so much, my friend from North Carolina. We were just at the Kennedy School. And what I want to do is lay out a framework for what I call the necessity of moral dissent. The necessity of moral dissent. I want to lay this framework out I want to talk for a moment about how it has worked in history and why it's so necessary now, and then I want to just talk with you and take questions. Um, I deeply believe with many others, I just, and, and I'm always getting these signs. So I walk in and I look at that bookcase, and the first book I saw says, Justice in Judaism. And I believe that deep within our being is a longing for a moral compass. Uh, for those of us who are moved by the cries of our brothers and sisters, for those who of us who recognize that justice and acts of caring and being concerned about the least of these and the vulnerable and the stranger and being fair to all members of the human family and educating every one of our children should never be relegated to the margins of our social consciousness or our public policy because it puts literally the soul of who we are in danger. And, I, and, I, and, 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 he's, and it's even spilling out beyond places like a divinity school. I did two years of study at, in the Mayo King Fellow at MIT and Otto Swammer came in one day teaching and he said to us, talking about economic theory, he said there's a blind spot in our economic theory called consciousness. And I raised my hand and said, I thought I was at MIT, not at the Divinity School. We're going to talk about consciousness. I said, you sound like a prophet. You sound like the language of the prophets. Um, and these issues are not just policy issues that should be left up some, to some puny left-right Republican, Democrat versus debate. The reality is how we treat the least of these, how we engage in issues around health care and economics and poverty and fairness in the criminal justice system and equal protection for all people regardless of their race, their creed, or their sexuality. How we, how we address the educating all our children are the centerpieces of our deepest traditions in our faith and the deepest traditions of our constitutional moral prescriptions. We are in a season more than ever that I believe we must remind public policy leaders of what Isaiah said to public policy leaders of his day in the 6th century BC. Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. We have to recover that language. The rights of the poor, the rights of the who rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. Martin Luther King, 46 years ago, said in one of his sermons, if you ignore the poor, one day the whole system will implode and collapse. And Otto Swammer was talking about that same thing. If you build a pyramid system where a few have at the top, but in the bottom you have all these cracks, eventually the whole thing will implode so that we must know in this season that the costs are too high for us not to address systemic racism, systemic poverty, and aggressive militarism that believes more in war on people than war against the injustices that destroy people. And every time we do this every time we fail to educate one child or fail to lift the health care for all people. It's not about whether you agree with Obama. <laughs> it's deeper than that. It's about whether or not you want to see literally the salvation of the soul of this nation because whatever we do on the front side in terms of denial will cost us on the back side. We must have a prophetic critique that destroys the myth of extremism. And that is the notion that extremism, the politics of denial, only hurt a small subset of people, i.e. black, 
i.e. poor, i.e. gay, i.e. immigrants, when in fact, extremism hurts us all. Now we've, our job has to be to unpack the truth about extreme policies that I'll talk about in a minute. This notion that we have this extremism, and I don't call it republicanism or, or, or democratic, um, democratic um, philosophy. It's, it's something else going on in our society right now. I said it earlier today, when you have people that can run for public office and win, and while they're running, they tell you that they're going to kill you at, in essence, that's kind of problematic. When they run and tell you, elect me, and this is the vision of a wholesome society that I'm going to bring into existence. Elect me, and I'm going to cut the heart out of public education, because that's how you develop a great nation. That's their philosophy. Elect me, and I'm going to take earned income tax credits from working poor people. Elect me, and I'm going to blame the poor rather than address the systems of denial that keep people poor. E elect me, and I will take free health care as an elected senator or an elected congressperson, but then deny that same health care to the people who voted for me. Just, just elect me. Elect me, and I will keep engaging in trickle-down economics that has already been proven time and time again not to work, but elect me and I will keep giving more money to the wealthy and taking more money from the poor. In fact, elect me, and I won't even mention the name poor in public policy today. Elect me and I will roll back 50 years of gains in voting rights. Elect me and, and I will actually Sing on July 4th, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown that good with brotherhood from sea to sign of sea. And then I will implement policies that refuses to have grace toward immigrants and grace toward women and grace before, toward the LGBT community. Elect me and I will actually sing one thing and do another. Elect me and I will put my hand on a Bible swear to uphold a constitution whose first premise is the establishment of justice. But elect me, I will put my hand on the Bible, claim that the only thing in that Bible has to do with abortion, prayer in the schools, and, 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 and homosexuality. I will dismiss the 2,000 scriptures that have anything to do with justice and treatment of the poor and treatment of the strangers. Elect me, and I will talk about freedom every chance I get but never talk about the establishment of justice, providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare, and domestic tranquility. When you have that kind of audacity, and you have people willing for whatever reading to vote for, the language, simple language of Democrat versus Republican, liberal, is too puny. There is a need for prophetic um, inquiry and for prophetic unpacking um, it is needed more now than ever before and there must be a movement rooted in moral dissent a movement that says we don't read the Gallup polls we don't make decisions based on the popularity we make decisions on higher principles or deeper principles even in a way you, you want to say. Someone tells, so said it like this, when you're in this kind of an environment, my son is an environmental physicist, and he said, Daddy, if you ever get lost in the wilderness, and it's in mountainous terrain, and I said, well, why would I get lost? He said, just in case, Daddy, go, go, go on. He says, don't walk out through the valley, because snakes live in the valley. He said, if you have to walk out, first climb up, the mountain, because if you go high enough, you will come to the snake line. And in biology, the biologists will tell you that at a certain point, snakes can't exist. They asphyxiate. They can't exist at higher ground. So don't walk through the snakes in the valley. Go up and then go over. There is a need to take America up. 
up out of this debate that's rooted where the snake, below the snake line. See, this left-right, Democrat versus Republican, Fox News versus NBC, that's below the snake line. And, it, and, 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 it, and, it, and people are dying below the snake line. Somebody has, to, somebody has to cry loud and spare not and tell America of her sins and, and, and develop a language or at least reclaim a language of moral dissent that will take us above. In other words, we got to go to higher ground. Lord, plant this nation on higher ground. Higher ground that believes we can educate all our children. Higher ground that believes we can provide health care for all of our citizens. Higher ground that believes we don't have to just write off 5 or 10% of our population and just say they're poor and they're predisposed to be that way and there's nothing you can do. We must recover the vision of having a vision. <laughs> and we need, we need a vision that says no to this deny, 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 deny. We, we need a vision that says you will not come to a greater America by turning everybody against Muslims, by turning everybody against the LGBT community, by denying racism, denying classism, and then after you've done all that denying do everything you can to diminish the president. I don't agree with everything the president says, but you ought to agree at least on the things that are right. You, you're, do, you're doing no service to the country by just denying, 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 and then after you create all this division, the ultimate coup d'etat is you make sure everybody can get a gun quicker than they can vote. That's low ground. That's low ground. We need a, a vision that says, let's, let's, let's believe again. Let's, well, maybe believe for the first time that we can have pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that create economic sustainability by fighting for full employment and living wages and the alleviation of disparate unemployment, a green economy, labor rights, affordable housing, targeted empowerment zones, strong safety net services for the poor, fair policies for immigrants, un uh, standing against extreme militarism that not only is wrong because of the war, but it robs us of being able to do the real things like a war against poverty, infrastructure development, and fair tax reform. We can believe in educational equality by ensuring every child access to a high quality, well-funded, constitutional diverse public education and access to community colleges and universities and, and properly funding minority uh, and, and, and universities. We can have health care for all. We can support at least a very minimum of the Affordable Care Act. Many of us wanted universal health care for everybody. You know, I rode over here today with a lady from the former Yugoslavia. She was from, from, from Bosnia. And she was telling me about universal health care in Bosnia. Come on. We can at least have universal health care. We can at least have Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security and provide for environmental, uh, environmental protections. Surely, surely we can, we can believe, believe in fairness in the criminal justice system and dealing with the inequities in that system that, that impact black, brown, and poor, disenfranchised white people. Surely, surely we can believe in protecting and expanding voting rights and women's rights and LGBT rights and labor rights and, and, and holding on to the fundamental principle of equal protection under the law. But we can't do that unless we have instruments of moral dissent. Now, for those of you in seminary, there's this little black book I read. Sometimes it's red, sometimes it's brown. It's got two testaments in it, <clears throat> old and new. And I heard that it's a living word, that it's not just a word for past, past centuries, but it's a living word. Uh, it's so living that it's taught in modern day seminaries like this. And you have to learn about the zits and labor, <clears throat> the setting of the text. Uh, you have to learn about exegesis opposed to eisegesis. Well, in that little book, Jeremiah 22 says, in the, in the international version, this is what the Lord says, go down to the palace, to the king of Judah, and tell him, this is what the Lord says, do what is just and right, rescue people from the hand of the oppressor 
and do no wrong to the foreigner or the child or the widow and stop killing innocent people. It didn't say to Jeremiah, send a smoke signal, i.e. send a text message or an email. It says there must be, when, when there are false prophets like Hananiah, there must be somebody that goes down, that doesn't just come to seminary to stay in seminary or to get a bigger church because you have a Harvard degree or a Duke degree like me. But you, you understand you are called to engage in prophetic inquiry and prophetic uh, uh, demonstration in the public square that the prophet has to go down. You know, in ancient Israel, while they went down, because the temple was up here, and the government agencies were down here. And what, Jer what God told Jeremiah is, you don't get to stay up here in this ivory tower and just preach little cute pastoral sermons. That true pastoral ministry is connected to prophetic ministry. Because if you're not concerned about changing the situation that caused your people to have all the pastoral needs that they have, then that's a form of pastoral irresponsibility. <laughs> then it says in Amos, it says, woe unto those who think they can be at ease in Zion. I think that word is applicable to us today. Woe unto us who think we can be at ease in Zion. And you remember the scriptures that came before that. It says, you have all the feast days you want, all the solemn assemblies. You have all the burnt offerings. That means you can have the hottest worship service ever. It'll be full of some kind of fire, but it may not be the Holy Spirit fire. It's something. And you can give all the peace offerings you want, you, but, and you can sing. You can have the best choir anywhere in the country. But if you're not concerned about justice rolling down like waters, and righteousness like the mighty stream, God says, take away the noise of your songs. Because they do not sound like melody to me. It sounds like a mess that you are using to escape your prophetic responsibility. And then you remember Jesus, his first sermon when he grabbed Isaiah 58, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61 and wrapped it all into one sermon, went down to the ghetto of Nazareth where he was from. <laughs> stood up in the temple and declared the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. And that word poor, there's a Greek word, patokos, which literally means not, it's three words for poor, but he, Luke puts on Jesus' lip that word. Not the poverty because you're lazy, as Proverbs talks about. Huh? Not the poverty just because you had a simple misfortune. But patokos means the poverty that's created because of systemic injustice and isolation and domination. And remember that when Jesus first preached that sermon, the system did not seek the killing. His own people that needed the message sought the killing because they had begun to believe the system. <laughs> but yet he stayed focused. And so the framework I want, and then I want to take some questions about what we believe in the small movement, is the prophetic voice um, as Brueggemann says, the prophet or the prophetic voice does not ask, can a vision be implemented? That's not the first question. Implementation, implementation of a vision is no, of no consequence until the vision can be imagined. Yes. <laughs> Imagination <laughs> must come before implementation. The prophets, Dr. King and others, never asked the question, they never knew all the answers of how they were going to overturn slavery or Jim Crow. They had a vision that something was better than slavery and Jim Crow. When William Lord Garrison was arrested in Boston by what he says was a respectable mob for preaching, the, the preaching what he called preaching the, the, the ungodly doctrine that all men are equal. <laughs> in Boston, you know, now watch this. I didn't say he was arrested in the South. William Lord Garrison was arrested in Boston for standing against slavery. But he kept on. Henry, Henry uh, Thoreau, uh, Thoreau was, uh, was, was arrested. Ralph Emerson said, went to him and said, 
what are you doing in jail? Thoreau said, what are you doing not in jail? <laughs> they asked him one day, said, will you repent? He said, the only thing I will repent of that I've been too quiet too long. Hmm? There was one, I told him there, 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 there was one justice by the name of Harlan out of Kentucky that dissented when Plessy versus Ferguson was made the law of the land. One justice, but his dissent was so powerful and so on point that Thurgood Marshall and, 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 and um, Charles Hamilton Houston were able to use his dissent to build their case against Jim Crow. A vision before implementation. And it must, be a, it must be a vision, as Brueggemann further says, and Mootmann says, and Cornel West talks about, and my grandmother talks about this rooted in the kind of hope that is the refusal to accept the, real, the reading of reality, which is the majority opinion. Because a lot of times, that's just optimism. That's not hope. The majority opinion is just rooted in optimism. Can we get enough votes to do it? But this kind of hope that we need coming from prophetic inquiries and prophetic instruments is subversive hope. The hope that says, I call into question your assumption or your suggestion that we have to just accept this poverty. And now, but understand, this kind of subversive hope will get you killed in this country. See, you can get killed for just standing up saying, I have a dream in the wrong place. You can get killed for having hope for all poor people to come up out of poverty. You, you can get killed for saying, I do not believe that the vaults of this nation are bankrupt. But somebody has to have the audacity born of the spirit to engage in that kind of hope that calls into question the realities that exist. You know, um, Rabbi Herschel put it like this. He said, the prophet was the individual who said no to his or her society, who condemned the habits and assumptions and complacency and the waywardness and the, and, and the cynicism of the society. The prophet brings to expression the rage of God. The rage of God. And so... I believe, like Dr. King said, in 1967, he did a sermon called The Meaning of Hope, but it started like this. He said, I'm worried about America. And I think we, part of prophetic movement is somebody that's worried. I'm worried, and I'm worried, about an America where resegregation is happening faster now in our public schools than it was in 1970. I'm worried. I'm worried about America where the poor can be blamed for being victims while money and corporations are treated better than people. I'm worried. I'm worried about a country that feels it's all right to di dismiss women. I'm worried about a country where you are still castigated because of your sexuality. I'm worried about a country that claims to be a democracy where people vote and you have so many people trying to keep people from voting. I'm worried about a country that still believes in too many places that guns and violence are the answer to our soul sickness. But the question is, what do I do with that worry? What do I do with that worry? Dr. William Turner, my mentor at Duke, professor of pneumatology, says that when you get born again, saved, changed, filled, however you describe it, whether you have an Episcopal description or a Pentecostal description, he says, it should be a crisis experience of conversion. It should be an experience that changes your entire life's orientation so that it necessitates a quarrel with the way things are. And however you describe your conversion experience, if it does not necessitate a quarrel with the world, then your conversion experience remains terribly suspect. Let me close here and take some questions about the movement. Because I believe we have to build indigenously led, state-based, because prophets are regional. It ain't about one, having one prophet, it's for the whole country. It's about, pro, you know, Dr. King never went further than 350 miles from his home in Atlanta and shifted the world. His context was the South. For prophet, we need indigenous 
deeply led, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racist, anti-poverty, anti-extreme militarism, transformative fusion coalitions led by clergy and other people who may not be people of faith but who believe in the moral arc of the universe. I believe we have to have it rooted in a serious agenda. And I want to say something that might, you might think at first is out of place at Harvard. I am a theological conservative. Now, for the reason I say that, I knew y'all weren't gonna say amen, because, <clears throat> see, we've allowed people to take language. Like, why do we call the religious right right if you believe they're wrong? And so we end up empowering the very thing we're trying to speak against with the wrong language. And Jay Carter, Jay, y'all, you need to read Jay Carter's book out of Duke where he talks about language can either be a tool of liberation or a tool of your own enslavement. So I'm a theological conservative. Why? My grandmother, whom I learned applied theology from, is to blame for that. My father is to blame for that, who was a trained theologian. They took their faith seriously. My mama, who had me singing songs like, oh, for a faith that will not shrink, huh? though, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe. So my father taught me that there's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't believe in justice. My grandmama taught me, son, if you're not helping somebody, your life ain't worth dirt. <laughs> so I'm a born and bred conservative, which is to say, I have a deep struggle with those who tend to call themselves conservative, who liberally resist and ignore so much of God's character. They claim to be conservative, but they liberally resist so much. They dismiss those 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that speak to justice and the poor and health, without which, Jim Wallace says, the whole Bible would fall apart. They say so much about what God says so little and so little about what God says so much. How can you be, a conser be conservative if you dismiss and downplay and have disdain for what Jesus said on his way to Calvary, the weightier matters of the law, like justice, love, and mercy? That's why I believe we need a true moral movement. I'm conservative. I want to conserve love and justice and care for the least of these. That's at the heart of those. And we must say in this time that there are those, yes, who say the concern that we ought to have as people of God is private soul saving and private devotion and private praise and private personal morality when the reality is... That is so far from the public announcements of our scriptures. And so I'm calling on y'all to reclaim your true conservative nature and to say in the most conservative way, I've decided to follow Jesus down to the palace where the poor are on the cross if necessary and ain't nobody turning back. I want you to say it as conservatively as you can. I will trust in the Lord until I die. I want you to be so conservative that you tell the whole world when you're down petitioning the governors and the, and the presidents and the other people regardless of their party, I'm a soldier in the army of the law. I've got my righteous war clothes on and I'm not going to ever turn back. Because we got some real issues y'all to deal with. And I want to take a seat and talk about some of those issues. But here, the framework I wanted to first do before we get into how to build a movement, what are the critical issues, is hopefully to pr pr prick your prophetic imagination. So I don't know what God's going to do with y'all. But I know what he told me like he told Ezekiel. Just go speak to the bones. And then let me do what I do. So I know some of y'all going to get troubled in your bedroom. Some of y'all are going to be riding down the car. Some of you from this point, your lessons and your theories are going to take on a whole different. Because all I'm required to do 
is just speak to the bones and say, bones, bones, it's time for a fresh season and a fresh cadre and a fresh school of prophets to arrive. Stop simply learning about history and ask God to give you the power in this moment of history to make history and to transform history so that when it's all over, your living will not be in vain. and a candidate for ordination in the Disciples of Christ. And I wanted to ask, you spoke about language and the power of language in the movement, but how it gets turned to oppression. And I have been concerned about how the language of civil rights has been co-opted by those who seek to keep oppressive systems of power in place. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts about how we keep that language of liberation alive. And, and one of the ways is the recovery of prophetic language, recovery of prophetic text, recovery of understanding that prophetic ministry is not just, as one guy told me, he said, Reverend, I'm, 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 now I'm, I'm pastoral and priestly, but I'm not a prophet. And I said, well, who told you the Holy Spirit could be that schizophrenic? <laughs> who told you you get to, you know, how do you separate the two? But, but, but let's understand, let me dig, probe your question a little deep, deeper. This has always been the case. So for instance, after slavery, you had something called the first reconstruction, right? In the first few years after slavery, black and white faith leaders, primarily all over the South, came together and restructured every Southern legislature. Black and white. In fact, in 1868, there were more blacks serving in the legislature in North Carolina then than there were a few years ago in the North Carolina legislature now. They were led by J.W. Hood, who was a preacher, Samuel Ashley, who came from up here in Massachusetts somewhere, who was also a con congregationalist. They called their movement Fusion Movement. And in the first few years, they rewrote constitutions. They put language in constitutions that said, Beneficent provision to the poor, the orphan, and the widow is the first duty of a civilized state. Based in deep morality, they, they, they made sure they protected voting rights, labor rights, criminal justice reform, and fair tax reform. These, these are Christians using moral language in 1868. But by 1862, the enemies of Reconstruction began to rise up, and the first thing they attacked was their language. So they called their movement the redemption movement. Now that sounds, you know, moral. They said, we, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have the redemption movement. Like Jerry Falwell used to say, you know, the moral majority. But you had to read what the redemption movement was trying to redeem. And what they were trying to redeem is the country from the integration and diffusion of black and white people working together. It was in that same context that the Klan gets formed, right? And within about, in the next 30 years, they spend time undoing everything, the fusion movement. And they use this, this hip, hip, heretical religious language, you know, to say the government should be in the hands of permanently of the white man. They use this stuff, to, this language to say we're wasting our tax dollars and, 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 and that there is, um, uh, uh, this innate um, disposition toward criminality among the people that we are allowing to be in power, right? So, so they, the second Reconstruction is 1954 to 1968. Dr. King, the others, movement, they use the, they grab this moral language. They use it. 
They forced the president. Kennedy talks about voting rights and moral, I mean, moral issue. Johnson, war on poverty, moral issue. All of the major things that begin to be ch changed is rooted in this deep moral language. You know, Dr. King basically takes um, uh, public policy, uh, progressive social politics, and, and, and Southern Baptist theology, uh, puts a little jazz in there, <laughs> slips in the rhythm of, of the African American tradition, and sprinkles a little Gandhiism in there, and uses it in a powerful way. How do they unpack it? You come up with the white Southern strategy. What does um, uh, uh, Lee Atwater later on say was the key to the light, right, water stat, right Southern strategy? Use language that doesn't sound racist or based in class, but is benign. So they start talking about states' rights, right? And law and order and fair tax policies. And he said that language sounds racially benign, but when the policies are implemented, it actually has a disparate and discriminatory racial impact. And more, and more importantly, it causes poor whites, particularly in the South, to see their problems as rooted in the, the opportunities coming to Afro America rather than the injustice that's being promoted by the racist oligarchy. And Ronald Reagan in 1980 uses that language in his speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi. I believe, my sister, we're in a time of a third, possible third reconstruction. I'm telling people, I mean, it's in the embryonic stages. I don't believe, I believe the electorate that elected President Obama in the South is, is representative, not him, but the electorate. And the new dynamics that you see in all these movements, whether it's from the immigrant movement, to the movement with the LGBT community, to poverty aggregates, to Moral Monday, all of these movements coming together, creating this stream of justice. And it's, and it's critical in this time that we use language. So that's why in our movement, we don't talk about, I never criticize a person for being a Republican or a Democrat. That's, you get trapped. I don't even use liberal versus conservative. I tell people whether I'm a liberal or conservative versus whether I'm using hot sauce to, to play the ketchup. You know, what, what is that? What, what, what do you mean? That's, those are traps. But prophetic language allows me to talk about the stranger, talk about justice. To, 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 get, to render a critique, and the way we critique in the Moral Monday movement, we look at a policy, and we have three critiques. Is it constitutionally consistent? Is it morally defensible? And is it economically sane? I don't care who proposes it, Republican or Democrat. Do, how does it live up to the tenets of life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of your own labor, and the pursuit of happiness? How does it live up to the establishment of justice. What kind of justice is going to be established if this policy is implemented? How is this going to promote the general welfare? And by the way, if welfare was good enough for the Constitution, why did we ever let folk take that language away from us? Um, how does it promote the, the common defense? How does it promote domestic tranquility? So you have to be intentional about it. And then you have to use lang you have to have develop a coalition that's using a language that doesn't look like the coalition they expect. So for instance, one day we were um, we would we were we were doing something in the legislature on voting rights. And one of the uh, white arrestees, uh, who's 80 some years old from Georgia, leaned over and said, Reverend Bob. Let's show them what this coalition is all about. I said, I said, what do you mean? She says, I'm going to go to the mic during the hearing and talk about how the policies are impacting black people. You go to the mic and talk about how it's impacting white women. <laughs> See, prophets are very creative. They'll do things like put wooden yokes around their neck, and then you break that one, they'll put an iron yoke. See, prophets, are, read the prophets, they're very creative. So, of course, I imagine this 80-some-year-old white woman going to the mic and, and, and looking at this all-white panel who's just tried to propose these voting laws saying, I know exactly what y'all is doing. You're just trying to hurt us black people. <laughs> now, now, she's white, you know, she's white. And I, I've been seeing this all my life. And, this, and, and one of them said, ma'am, you, 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 you mean, you, you're not really here to speak? She said, I know what I'm saying. And then when I went up, I said, I'm president of the NAACP, 
And I want to talk today about how these policies are going to be negative toward white women and women. And one of the guys said to me, Reverend Bob, aren't you going to testify about, I said, oh, my sister handled that. And you have our written testimony, but I want to talk about how, you, you see what I'm saying? You begin to not only change the language, but change the picture. Lastly, in order to flip this language, progressives, we love data, but sometimes we don't love people. I've been to a lot of progressive conferences that talk about how a policy is impacting the sick, and they don't have any sick people there talking about it. See, you can't just, Ezekiel was told, lay among the people for seven days before you speak. Don't just go out and speak on their behalf. You must become community with the people. So one of the reasons we speak on poverty, I speak on poverty, is because we did a poverty tour. 2,000 miles, 30-some cities, went in the woods. We saw whole families of black and white people living there. We went underneath the interstates and saw, saw veterans using the interstates for something other than a toll road. You know, we, we, moved, we, we, we went there, and then we said to those people, we don't, we're not going to Raleigh to advocate for you. We, gonna, we want you to come. So on the Marl Monday stage, no politician can get on that stage. And I hope some of you all will go look at the videos on the Forward Together channel. No politician can get on that stage. Only advocates and the people being impacted. So when we do a sit-in, for instance, in the speaker's office, it's not just advocates and preachers. It's advocates and preachers and Crystal who's dying from cervical cancer because our state won't expand Medicaid. You see what I'm saying? That changes the language. <laughs> and, we, and, and the media is in that. And they, they may hear me say 500,000 people are being denied access to Medicaid because our government and legislature will not expand it. And then they may hear another, and, and I may say that's wrong because, you know, in the Bible, Isaiah says such and such and such a thing. And then an advocate says not only is it 500,000 people, but it's 23,000 veterans and 50,000 construction workers and 20,000 people in the medical field and, and it's costing the state $8 billion and ta da 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 But then Crystal says, but it's really me. If you want to see what this policy is doing, I'm here, a mother of two, dying of cervical cancer. And I've asked Reverend Barber to call my name in every speech he does so that when I die, there'll be video that my children can know that mama didn't just go out. See, we got to put a face on these policies and the devastation that they've caused. And that's what begins to change the language. And we've got to believe finally that there are, that, that don't ever think you're the only one. What did God tell one of the prophets? He said they're, not, they're 900, 700, they've not bowed. You know, if you would have told me when we started our movement that 13% of the people that would get arrested would be Republicans, I might have told you, uh-uh. If you'd have told me we could organize in Mitchell County that's 99% white, 89% Republican, I might would have told you, uh-uh. But what I found out is there's this longing for a moral compass that transcends or transforms, you know, uh, people's political persuasion. So, and if you try it, I've found people, we've had Republicans and Democrats coming together saying, look, we don't agree with this extremism. You know, don't ever forget it was a Republican named Teddy Roosevelt in 1912 who cried out and said, here are, here are moral categories. Living wages, health care for all, union rights, getting money out of politics. You, you see what I'm saying? So, so the other way you change language is you, you, you work hard at building a coalition that's, that doesn't look like what the extremists expect. And when the papers and other people see that, it forces a different kind of language. And then lastly, you got to be loud and right. <laughs> you can't be loud and wrong. So you got to have a strong, any, any serious movement. I think all preachers ought to have a policy advisor. 
so you can engage in pro prophetic preaching. It's more than just saying little cute words. You, you know, you can really know. You really, if you talk about a war on poverty, you can really know what the war on poverty did and what happened when it was ended. You, when you talk about voting rights, you can really deal with that. You, you can know what the damage is. I mean, you, you, you're, you become an, a, a theo expert, <laughs> a theo policy expert, or at least you have a policy expert around you. But, 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 uh, but in addition to that, um, you got to say it long enough. We first started Moral Monday. I don't know if you all heard. 17 people went in. One but seven preachers and 10 average folk into the General Assembly. They let us pray, sing, and talk about them for an hour, and then they arrested all of us. You know when I knew they had messed up, when I knew a movement was started? When the lady that was with us that had cerebral palsy, when they arrested her and put those handcuffs around her in that chair, when she was shaking like this, I said, mm-hmm power has just gone over and and it wasn't my picture that went in the paper it was hers it was her being rolled out and people had said to us they're going to rest you and that's all and the next monday 34 people showed up we didn't even call them <laughs> you see and we started and we and we did and we didn't preach in a in the divinity chapel or in the church we decided to hold church in the general assembly Say, if you want to put on our arrest record, arrested for prayer, singing, and, 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 and talking loud, which is prophetic preacher, then go ahead. And what we found is that the people were ready even more so than the leadership. But then we had to be committed not just to one Monday. So we've done 120 actions, but that particular summit was 13 consistent Mondays. We went from 17 to 25,000. And then in 2014, 100,000 people showed up in one day. But we continued to go and build. We went from seven preachers to 1,000 rabbis, imams, and other clergy, Christian clergy. But it's not easy work. But you got to be, you, you, you gotta be willing to use this moral language and critique public policy and then engage in moral actions that will shape public consciousness and do it long enough. When we first did it, three, the newspaper said, oh, it's just a bunch of people getting together. They, and you can't get mad about that. But by the fifth week, the, the papers were changing their tune. And by the eighth week, the papers editorials were saying we were right and the legislators were wrong. And by the 15th week, the governor had gone from 50% in the polls to 35% in the poll, and the legislature had gone from 40% in the poll to 17% in the poll. But it, yes, so, so that's a number of things you, we have to do. And I hope you'll get this book called Forward Together, A Moral Message for the Nation, because it out, actually outlines the 12 steps that we have found work and what we need to see happening around the country. Another question? Who's this great professor just walked in here? I saw all of y'all. You got scared. All y'all got scared like he was getting ready to give you an exam. <laughs> Don't I know you? <laughs> yes, sir. What, what's, what's this your name? Huh? Okay, well, our heart knows each other. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Anybody have a question? <laughs> I know it's got to be the last one, I'm, and we're sorry we were a little late, but yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you so much. Check your mic. No, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for everything. Um, my name is Kara Curtis. I'm a Divinity School student here as well. And I have a question because um, some of us next week are going to be engaging in a week long protest, um, uh, engaging Harvard and asking Harvard to divest its endowment from fossil fuels, which as we know, is a racial justice issue. It's an economic justice issue as well as an environmental issue. Um, but my question relates to the fact that um, it's, uh, Harvard has really dug in its heels, and it's really looking like a possibly prolonged um, yep. campaign at this point. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any advice for um, kind of this continual process of engagement and, and digging deep and um, kind of in the long haul, especially when you're working with a coalition of people who aren't all coming from this language of um, prophetic witness and faith, um, which you know we find to be like incredibly um, useful, but just um, from folks from lots of different kind of uh, backgrounds mm -hmm. relating to that. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, yeah. Well, first of all, <laughs> don't give up your witness. Uh, we have people of all, I had people say to me, Reverend Bobby, you don't have to back off because you, you know, there are atheists who want to be in this movement and they're not going to come. I say, yes, they will. In fact, now we have atheists who are coming in the movement. And some of them have said, you know what? I found out I wasn't angry at religion. I was angry at that stuff people were preaching that were using in religion to beat up people. I never even heard what you're talking about. And then some, <laughs> then some people are still atheists. And we say, OK, if your moral precision comes from the Constitution, that's fine. But don't ask me to not, because you cannot show me a major transformative movement in this country that did not have a deep moral push. You won't find it. Slavery, into slavery, reconstruction, social security, New Deal, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, fair housing, women's suffrage. You, you will not find a movement that did not have a strong moral critique somewhere underneath it. So first of all, don't give up your witness. Secondly, you know, you all are learning all this great stuff about organizing, and it's, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, don't don't get up here, you know, don't 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 you know, don't come to Harvard and learn how not to believe the Bible. Use all the tools and then and, and, and you know, learn all the exegetical, critical. What is it called? They call a uh, uh, what's the difference? Come on, exegesis, huh? hermeneutics, and different kinds of hermeneutics. Now, you know, you got literary critique. Come on, y'all want you? Feminist critique. I thought y'all were at Harvard. Come on now. <laughs> Don't you let a Duke man mess with y'all like that. But after you do all of that, remember your best example. How, how did Jesus do it? He didn't just begin a movement. He produced disciples. How did Isaiah keep talking after he was dead? <laughs> I mean, right? Come on, I can say that. I might not say this in the church, but I can say this in here because Auntie might say, now, Reverend Bob, now you know what that book says, Isaiah. It does. But you all know it was first Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, and probably he wasn't around for second and third. But he had a school of prophets that wrote in his name. So whatever, when you begin a movement, you must be, you must be ensure that you create people that can carry it on. Because see, when you graduate, you might be gone, oh, but you have to create it. So in our movement, the Moral Monday movement, we intentionally have young people right in the middle. We have intentionally have young adults right in the middle. We intentionally have, when, I, when you go to a Moral Monday event, I never stand on stage with I'm actually violating all the Moral Monday principles right now. If they see this video, they're gonna get really bothered. Because normally, we would, I would have people around me. Remember when Dr. King was at the March on Washington? Look at that picture. It's instructive. He's not standing at that podium by himself. It's a, it's a cadre of people. So, so build the imagery and, the, and be intentional about that in what you're building so that things can last beyond your tenure. You know, I'm gone now. I'm in, I'm in sabbatical at Union. I just flew up here to be with you all for a minute. And people said, Grandma. You can't leave. You're the leader. I said, mm, I'm the servant leader. And, and I need to leave sometime because if the movement implodes when I leave, then I need to check what kind of leadership I'm providing. Yeah. You see? So that is, so, so, it's, so, and that's biblical. That's, that you, whether it's Isaiah or whether it's Jethro, <laughs> you know, that the, the daddy of, Zipporah saying to Moses, you're going to kill yourself. That's, that's the southern yourself. I know at Harvard it would be yourself. But, but down south we say yourself. <laughs> huh? he, said, he said, you're going to kill yourself. You need to figure out how to break these people up in the 50s and assign leadership so that everything doesn't come to you. So as you're building your protest Make sure you build and deepen your structure. Do both at the same time, and you will find. And if your arguments are strong, the very power of the arguments will have some staying power. You see what I'm saying? It will have some staying power. Um, so, and, and, and I'm glad to hear you're doing that. Stay strong. Yeah. Any others? So if there are no others, I'd like to close right here. 
please get the book um, and learn and learn more about the Fort Together movement. Oh, May 19th, there's a possibility that there's going to be an action in Washington, D.C., because in the 50th year of the Voting Rights Act, we do not have Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. 50 years. And what the Congress has thought about considering, if it was passed, would leave most of the states out that were covered in 65. In other words, we'd have less protection today than we won in 65. That's a tragedy. And people, you know, have been talking about businesses pulling out and, and, and sports teams pulling out over this religious freedom, and they should. But there should be a similar moral outcry about voting rights. Because if you're concerned about LGBT rights and women's rights and immigrants, you have to be concerned about voting rights and the denial of voting in this time. So you may get a call. You may hear about it, about the prophets going down to the palace and refusing to leave. I'm going to ask you to join. You'll be out of school. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask you to join. Put your, put your collar on or whatever is the symbol of your faith. Uh, Sharon Watkins may be there. You come on. And don't wait till you're 40, 100. You can do it now. We need some young prophets. Secondly, July the 6th, I'm extending every one of you an invitation. I'm, just like Dr. King called people to Selma, July the 6th, I'm calling people to North Carolina because on July the 6th, we start the first and the worst voter suppression case trial since 1965. And how North Carolina goes is going to determine how the nation goes. And we're going to have a mass march that day at the end of the trial. If you're concerned about voting rights, if you're concerned about the 15 states that have decided, mostly in the South, to initiate some of the worst voter suppression we've seen since 1965 and some of the worst redistricting we've seen since the 19th century, I'm going to invite you to come down to North Carolina and walk with us to show the nation and the world that the prophetic voice still lives and that we are not going to turn around. Those are two asks that I have of you, as well as your prayers. And I want to close with this, something I share everywhere I go, because I understand the burden of ministry. And some years ago, I was struggling with a bout of depression. You all saw me walk in here. My legs went out in 1993. They said I'd never walk again. Uh, but God didn't say that. <laughs> um, but, but I was told I might never walk again, might be in a wheelchair in a nursing home forever, went through some serious issues of depression. And I won't go through the whole thing, but something happened to me one night. I had a tremendous move of the spirit and the visitation. And out of that thing, I wrote this, and I want to share it with you as a gift to you. It's called What is Life? Because that's literally what I had to consider at 30. Everything I had done up to 30 years old seemed to turn to gold. If I wanted it, I got it. If I touched it, I had it. I never thought my legs would go. I, I used to leg press hundreds of pounds. The last thing I ever thought would be my legs. And I wrote this out of that moment. What is life? Is it to be lived for or to dreamed about? Perhaps both. Maybe our dreaming determines our living to some degree. Yet so much comes to kill our dreams, snatch our dreams, take away our dreams, defer our dreams, and keep our dreams from reality. Maybe then we must fight for and pray for and ask God to grant us the gift of dreaming afresh and anew. Dreaming God's dreams. Dreaming, hoping, and delighting in the things of God freshly poured out upon our hearts and minds like the morning dew. How we need it so. Then perhaps if we dream right, we will live right and we will know the answer to the inquirer's question. What is life? Is it to be dreamed about or lived or both? The spirit brings the gift of dreaming into the now. What God has hoped becomes even if at first just in our thoughts, a new reality. We began to see and dream in the now what God has always wanted since the beginning. God's dreams become our desires when the spirit is at work. Men may never understand, women may never understand, people may never understand, but that is what happened deep in the soul place of Sojourner 
and Mary and Martin and Elizabeth and Garrison and Mega and Malcolm and Harriet and Fannie Lou and Mandela and Dorothy and Mother Teresa, God's dream. What moved them and so many others? By the spirit, come take a look. The cow laying down with the bear. Children playing over the hole of a snake, lying and lamb following together. God's dreams, humanity redeemed, grace imparted, pain pushed away, tears and wiped, death vanquished, the hungry fed, the hurting healed, justice ruling, righteousness prevailing, deliverance complete, Satan snared. God's dream, what a wonder, what a look. Our lives are transformed when we dream God's dreams. No longer mere mundane movement, away, away with despair and life without purpose. We now rise, captivated and controlled by God's dreams. And so it seems our dreams determine our living and we live because of our dreams. Oh, spirit of the living God, invade Invade, invade, please invade once again the nightmarish corners of our minds and loose the prophetic flow into the depths of our being with God's dreams so that we might live anew and afresh. Amen. As we come to a close, I'd like to invite Dean Hernandez to give a few words. She would uh, so grace us with her presence. No. <laughs> she is a student leader. I'm a student. Okay. Where are you from, student? Doctor Hills, New York. Oh, all right, all right. Bless your heart. Well, my apologies that I couldn't be here for the whole thing. It's one of those very busy days, but um, what a privilege to be here for um, the last few minutes. Um, you, in the 20 minutes that I heard uh, your talk, I was inspired. Um, I was, um, before coming here, um, the work that I do um, and that I've been focused a lot on um, in the last few years is immigration and immigration reform and sort of the human rights violations that are happening um, at the border. Um, and so we were uh, showcasing a film about the children that are making the treacherous um, journey to the United States, seeking a better life and safety. Um, and we had a panel discussion, so that's why I was a little late. But um, it so connects with what you were sharing, um, because it's easy to lose faith and um, to feel like there's no hope or what difference can one person make. But so you've inspired me, and in a very short time, <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming to Harvard Divinity School. Um, what a blessing. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. Um, I didn't introduce myself. My name's Sonia David. Um, I'm a participant in. <laughs> thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm a participant in um, Harambe, HDS Harambe, and um, I'm a, um, a part of the uh, committee for the initiative for the race, uh, for the Center for Racial Justice and Healing. Sorry, it's a mouthful. <laughs> okay, so got that out of the way. Um, as we close, I just wanted to say a word of thank you 
Um, so I'll begin by saying to the spirit, to the entity, to the deity, to the internal human being that moves all things and persons to higher planes, that gives us perspective, passion, and perseverance to create change in troubling times and give us hope, peace, faith, and love. Thank you. To, this, to all of you who've taken the time out to be here on this rainy Friday afternoon, who've chosen to make the disparities of community a priority, who have determined that it was not robbery to join us as we develop our ideas, enliven our determination, and embody a movement. Thank you. To you, Sister Yara Ad Allen, for sharing your voice and vibrating our ears, tuning our bodies, preparing us to sustain a great movement of people in this room, at this university, in this state, in this nation, towards justice and reconciliation. Thank you. And to you, Reverend Dr. William Barber, thank you for you have so graciously given of your time, your wisdom, your spirit, and goodwill. You so kindly share your passion and invite us into this space to foster compassion, impressing upon us the importance of loving and enduring together. On behalf of HDS Harambe and the Initiative for Racial Justice and Healing, we would like to, re well, can the people who are present stand up so that this is Harambe. all of us? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. We would like to present you both with gifts to say that we are, sincere, that we are sincerely grateful Thank you all for your time and for your presence.